Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Discovery Church. How many of you guys excited to be here today? Amen. Well, we are excited to have you here. It's my honor and privilege to get the opportunity to speak today. And before we jump into the message, let's welcome all those locations joining us from all over. We've got uh, Northwest joining us today, Cal State having their uh, location over there, and everybody joining us online, man. We are excited that you're here. And for those of us in the room, give yourself a little shout out. Come on now. Hey, we have been running with this series that has been absolutely life-changing, this concept of the names of God. And uh, I just, I'm so grateful that we get opportunities like this because it, whether you realize it or not, what we're trying to do is almost have like a recentering uh, with our perception of who God is. And so I, I think what can happen sometimes is a narrative gets created through our life and we create a perception of who God is that doesn't align with the name of God that he's given us, right? And so we'll see throughout Scripture, there's times that a name of God is like directly giving to, given to us, right? So we could see like a, with Mary and, and the angel comes down, and he says, you will call him Emmanuel, right? Clearly giving the name, right? You see another, uh, when Moses is like, who are you? Like, what do I tell him? And he says, you tell him I am, right? Like, like drops the name drop right there. Today we're talking about a name that, that is different, that came through a different form, right? So in this concept of, of how things are revealed to us from God, it's so crucial that we come to this understanding because to me, it shifts everything about your faith when you understand this completely, okay? Because I grew up with a perception of God as distant, um, and, and I don't know how to explain it. Like if I would go to him, I felt like I was bothering him. Anybody else have like a, a perception of God that way that we were kind of raised? And some of you guys may have it right now. And, and the idea of how we've come to know who God is, the craziest concept, the only reason we know about God is because he tells us and shows us. I know that doesn't sound groundbreaking, but look at it this way. Like God, who spent the time of creation, who is who's marvelous in all his works, who who cares for everything, then said, how do I get my people to understand how I love them? How do I get my people to understand that I will go before them and fight their battles, right? How do I get my people to understand my heart and yearning for them? If that doesn't blow your mind, shift your focus a little bit. Because what we're coming to understand is that we have a God who wants to reveal to us the issue is, is that what we've had in our lives is evidence of something else that we've grabbed hold of and we've given a name to God that is not his. So this is like a recentering for us and looking and saying like, okay, so, so maybe I've given a name to God that is not lined up. Maybe I've, I've seen him as somebody who ignores me. Maybe I've seen him as somebody distant. And so what I'd love for you to do, if it's your first time here at Discovery, or a couple times, and maybe you miss parts of the series of Names of God, it is a great opportunity to go back and recenter because I genuinely feel like what God is, is doing in this series is locking us in to understand who he is, to give us that firm foundation that we sing about so that we can move into the season that God has for us. Amen? And so as we're learning about in theology, right, I'm a, I'm a big fan of theology. We lead a class called Foundations. And so in theology, the way they teach it this way of how God brings revelation is God brings revelation in two ways. There's the general, right, generic, and then there's specific, okay? So there's two ways in which God is, has brought forth his names to reveal who he is. And so, again, the specific is where God is like, this is my name, and this is what it means, and this is how I show up for you. The name that we're studying today was actually um, brought about from, from David's perceptions of his life as he's walked along uh, this journey, uh, when he writes this uh, name, when it comes to the realization and it's revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, you see that it lines up with his journey in his life, right? And so the name that we're taking a look at today is this uh, name Jehovah Rohi or Rohi. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Don't fight with me after service. It's all good. Tomato, tomato, right? Come on now. Even though it's clearly tomato, if anybody didn't know that. Uh, so in this one, Jehovah Rohi, which means the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, and uh, it leads directly into one of the most famous uh, passages that we have in our scriptures, uh, Psalm 23. So we're going to take a moment before we really dive into the application of all this, and I want us to kind of stop and, and look at 
uh, a, a psalm that David penned. And if you guys aren't familiar, psalm is almost like, a, like poetry, right? So, psalm, so David is writing this out from his experience. We can imagine that he's probably sitting in prayer and, and he's looking at his life and, and he's coming to a, a deep realization in Psalm 23. And so we're going to jump into that. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. And that direct translation is actually that idea of like, I have all that I need. It directly translates to I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd and I have nothing that is lacking in my life. Okay. He, li- he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. So like those first three verses there, what David's writing about is the provision that God gives to us, right? What he provides. And the beautiful thing is that, again, if we have this poor perception of God as distant, then this directly, you know, slaps it in the face. Because what this is saying is that your shepherd, his shepherd, is right alongside him and he knows that he needs food. He needs rest, right? He makes him lie down. He brings him to streams so that he could drink. Like, like this shepherd is directly involved in his life in the provision that they need. Then the next part we look at and we see that even when I walk through the darkest valleys, even when I walk through, not if, even if I walk through, like he'll show up. If, if I have to go that way, when I do, because we've all been in some dark valleys, I will not be afraid because you're right beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me He says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies, and you honor me by anointing my head with oil, and my cup overflows with blessing. So we go from how God provides, the shepherd provides this shepherd to where now we're seeing how the shepherd will protect, right? So even if if I'm in the darkest valleys, even if I'm eating with my enemies, even like I have protection, and then we're going to close it out with this idea of Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I'll live in the house of the Lord forever, meaning that final stage is the preservation, right? At the end of my days, as I've walked out all these difficult situations, I know that, God, you will preserve me. This shepherd will preserve me and move me forward. Beautiful poetry. You could see why it it lasts so long. But there's a a huge component to this that sometimes we maybe haven't identified with in our own lives. And and that is that if if we're saying Jehovah Rohi, right, he's the shepherd, he's my shepherd, what does that make us? Sheep. And here's the thing, man, I, I did a deep dive study into sheep, right? And I had this amazing revelation that's gonna totally shift the way that you live your life. And that is that sheep are dumb super dumb. Like, like honestly, the more you study about sheep, you're going to be like, how are they not extinct, bro? Like, these guys, I don't even understand. Like, sheep are so dumb and so fragile, if they lay down wrong, they will die. Have you ever, I mean, some of us maybe, have you ever been, like, so, like, not there, like, laying down is a risk for you? If they go too far over, they're just stuck. They don't know how to, (laughs) how do I get back over, right? That's sheep. That's you in this narrative, right? Like coming to terms with that is a little rough, you know? I think about this like in David's life, dude, David's gnarly. David's been through some things and seen some things. And so I would think if I'm going to write a psalm about like who I am, like I might have, be having conversations with God and be like, you know what, God, I'm going to write this prayer and, and, and I'm going to write about how, like, I'm a war horse and I just go into battle for you. And God's like, ah, not quite. Let's try again. He's like, okay, okay, okay. I'm like a tiger, you know, like, oh, jump out and then tear apart my enemies. And God's like, ah, not quite. And David's like, all right, you're okay, okay, God. So, like, how are you seeing this then? And God's like, oh. Let me be honest. Remember how you spent the first, like, 10 years of your life as a shepherd? Yeah. Remember those sheep? No. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Right? 
Like, like David has seen some things, and if anything, I'm sure he would love to identify with many different amazing, cool, gnarly animals, right? Like a bear, ah, you know, it's like, no, you're, you're a sheep, man, you're a sheep. You don't want to know, like, the self-defense mechanism if you're a sheep? Nothing, right? <laughs> there isn't one, you know? Like, literally, this is the, the, the sheep's best line of defense. What they'll do when they're in danger is they look for other sheep, and they pack together, and they yell for help. <laughs> hey! Hey! That's their defense. And then I thought, like, okay, let me look into this. So, like, they pack together. So then if a wolf gets in there, they're like, oh, like, nudge it, right, or do something. It's like, no, dude. They just die. <laughs> We're sheep, man. Like, that, that's us. And, and I know it's not painting, like, a pretty picture, but it's something that we have to come to terms with. We're sheep, right? Without a shepherd, we're not in a good situation in our lives. And I, I want us to kind of walk out, because I think a lot of us may think that we are aligned and walking in good with a shepherd. And I, I think we can look at some evidence in our lives that's clearly saying something else. Okay, and so I'm going to kind of walk out like, what does it look like for us to live a life that's not uh, uh, aligned with a good shepherd because there's evidence that you could see as sheep when you're out of the fold, when you're not with the good shepherd because the good shepherd would make sure that you're taking care of in these areas. And the only way you'd be operating that way is if you're out of alignment or out of the good shepherd's flock. Okay, so the first thing that you're going to see in your life is that your life is going to be heavy. Your life is going to be heavy. Okay, so again, you're going to hear this a lot. Again, sheep are dumb. They're not, like, great at self-preservation, you know? And uh, fun fact you may not have known about sheep. Like, I'm going to end this series, like, with so much information about sheep. You guys are going to be sheep experts. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> sheep, <laughs> sheep will actually, if they are not sheared, will get so bulky that they will die because they cannot move. That's it. They're just... They get stuck like that because their wool has gotten so much so that they cannot move forward. They can't go anywhere. And I, the easy comparison with our life is that so many of you guys and us, myself, we grab hold of all these burdens in our lives and we shoulder these things that just is not your burden to bear. You stress over how am I going to provide for my family? You stress over, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe who I was. I can't believe who I am. And you pile it on, and you feel guilt, and you feel shame, and you get anxious, and you get frustrated. And anybody else like me, like, you could sit there and not. Like, the most evident way I see it in my life when I'm misaligned with the shepherd and I'm going my own way is when I lay my head down on the pillow. Anybody else like me, like, suddenly all is clear. You suck, right? <laughs> it's clear as day to me. Head, head hits the pillow, and I'm like, oh, those are all the terrible things I did today. Yeah, good job, Sean. I'm glad you can remind yourself. And it's just all these burdens, and I cannot sleep at night because I'm analyzing mistake after mistake and fear after fear and burden after burden of how am I going to do this? How am I going to? And I carry all this on my shoulders. I don't sleep at all. I wake up the next day angry, frustrated, anxious, stressed. And I go through another day, and I put more and more wool on me, and I put more and more wool on me until I'm at the point where I am just stuck. I can't go anywhere because I'm stuck right where I am because I'm terrified of how I could take on more. Our life gets heavy. When we look at it in, in Scripture, David has another psalm, and he says, My guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden that's too heavy to bear. In our lives... As it compares to the sheep, here's the difficult situation when you carry all those burdens and it gets so heavy and that guilt and that shame piles up. Do you know what kills a sheep when their wool piles up so much? Heat stroke. Their wool will get so far out that they'll literally die when the heat turns up. Yeah, some of y'all seeing it already, right? When you are carrying your own burdens, when life turns up the heat, you fall apart. You melt away. You fold under the pressure because you're not aligned with the good shepherd. You're trying to do it on your own, and you can't. You can't. And so in our lives, the, the, I want us to kind of look at a 
a practical way that we could walk this out. Because here's the thing that is so true. How many of you guys have ever heard of let go, let God? If it's your first time at Discovery, you're like, you're new to this faith thing. We have a lot of phrases we just throw around, you know. <laughs> let go, let God is one of them, you know. And what that means is like this idea of like, like I can't do it, it's on God, right? Like, God, you're going to have to do it. And that is a great practice for us to have. But there's sometimes that God is saying, no, grab God, get going. Right? Like, like let go, let God. Awesome. But actually, I need, you got this. Let's align together and let's move forward in what I have for you to take some ground, right? But if you're a sheep carrying that burden and God's saying, grab me, get going, you're like, uh, kind of stuck, dude. So it's this idea of, of how do we practically help get away from carrying these burdens and align with the Father. I want us to give us like a practical way. Like this is your takeaway. You could, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. What you're going to want to do, because again, I feel like the attack is most common before we're going to bed, and that's when it like starts grabbing a hold of us or at night when we're on our own thoughts. You want to have a prayer journal and a gratitude journal. A prayer journal and a gratitude journal. When those things are building up on your shoulders and you feel like there's no way I'm going to be able to do it, Put in the prayer journal. Let go. When you need a reminder of what God has done in your life so you can believe that it's time to grab God and get going, you get your gratitude journal. So when God shows up in your life, you put in the gratitude journal. When you're needing that reminder so that you could step out and what God has for you, go back and read how it is that God has stepped up in those moments before, and you're going to be able to grab God and get going. Amen? So have those two things. Like, that's a practical way if you're saying, dude, I'm a stressor. I get anxious. I get fearful. I get frustrated. I get, you know, scared. Get a prayer journal. Get yourself a gratitude journal and make that a best practice. It's going to help you as you take those steps. Amen? Second thing that you're going to find if you're misaligned or out of the fold is you're going to find that you lack direction and purpose. Okay? You lack direction and purpose. All right, here we go. Fun fact about sheep. Here we go. All right, so sheep, right? Doubling down on this idea of how dumb they are, right? So sheep, <laughs> sheep will follow. If there's no shepherd, if they can't find them, sheep will follow the next closest sheep, okay? So let's say in our scenario that I'm a sheep and I'm following the sheep in front of me, and then the sheep behind me, who's he following? Me. And then the sheep behind him, who are they following? Them. And here's the craziest thing. Sheep are so dumb that if that lead sheep who's trying to find just where to go or maybe seeking after food or whatever will literally walk off a cliff. This is a thing. They won't recognize and say, oh, cliff danger. Not too bright. Cliff danger. They just kind of go for it. The next sheep won't look and say like, oh, that doesn't look too good, dude. They just look and they're like, well, if he did it. Right? Like, Johnny, Johnny, where are you going? Oh, you're going down there. <laughs> and then what happens to the next sheep? Like, oh, where's, where's Frank? Johnny, Frank, wait. Oh, you're down there. They'll do it so much so. There's a, there's like a, they, they captured this moment where 1,500 sheep jumped off a cliff just watching the next dude. Craziest part about it, you know, 200 of them died. Do you know why only 200 of them died, even though 1,500 jumped off the edge? That's so sad. I'm like, Johnny, no. Johnny goes, Frank, no. They go. And then you go, you're like, oh, thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Frank. I'm like, wasn't so bad. You... <laughs> Appreciate that, man. See you later, buddy. And so I know it seems ridiculous, right? Like, how do we compare this to our lives? Dude, we've literally built an app that allows us to just follow people. We call them followers, right? Right? There's like a whole social media platform where we just follow other people as they give us the highlights of their life where they're like staging the perfect environment for them. And, and then we watch it and we're like, oh, I want to be like that. Little do we know that Johnny's just jumping off the cliff. And we're like, I want to I'll follow that dude. And we're like, I want to jump off the cliff too, right? They turn off the camera and all of a sudden, <laughs> all heck breaks loose, right? Like it's, they're just giving you the highlights, but we're just following right behind them. We live in a culture, and it's clear and it's obvious. It's not an opinion. It's, we live in a culture in which the ability to follow someone off a cliff is so much more prevalent than any other time in our generation because it's just there. And here's the thing. If we are not equipped and ready to follow the shepherd, 
The problem is, you may be Johnny. Someone here, his name is Johnny. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you <laughs> join online. Sorry, Johnny. Like, if you're, you may be the Johnny for your family. You may be walking right off the cliff, and you've got your family right behind you. It, it should make you pause for a second and say, how am I staying close to the shepherd? How am I making sure I'm not leading my family right off the edge into devastation, right? When we look at it in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, when people don't have uh, divine guidance, they run wild. If anybody's over 15, you absolutely know that to be true, right? Unless you're like that guy, found Jesus when you're three, served faithfully now, start a small group, let me join it, right? I'd love to be a part of that. But many of us hit our teenage years, we stop taking divine guidance, we stop taking all guidance, we know exactly what it looks like to run wild. Some of us know exactly what it looked like yesterday, right? Many of us know what this life is like to just run wild, and we know what it brings us, and it's not great. It's cliff diving time after time after time, okay? And it's time for a shift. That's the kind of life that you have when you don't have that divine direction or purpose. And so the practical way for you to do that, and, and this is what cracks me up. If, if it's your first time at Discovery, we have a lead pastor. I'm not the lead pastor. It's Pastor Jason, Pastor Veronica, and Pastor Jason. Best teacher. I've been with this dude 10 years. Best teacher I've ever been able to serve with. Amazing preacher. And he just shocks me how he can make something like it, it, it's repeated every single week, and somehow he makes it sound new and fresh. And like I'm looking at it, like the practical way to find alignment is pretty easy, but I feel like we've said it like a million times. Start your day off with prayer and time with God. I don't know how many times, you know what I mean? Like if it's your first time, it's a great tool. Use it. You're going to love it. If it's your hundredth time and you're like, oh, we'll try it next time. Again, I, I'm very much a sheep. And I look at it in my life, like if, if I go hiking, I would recommend, I'm like not a survivalist at all. If I'm going hiking, don't come with me unless there's like an expert with us, right? I'm going to, but even I know, even I know as a survivalist, I should have something to give me my bearings. Where am I going? How do I get back? Am I just staying on the trail? Even I know that. And that's saying a lot, right? So in our lives, you have a duty and a responsibility to those that you're called to lead. If you don't find it important to start your day by getting your bearings, I don't, I, I don't know how to over-prioritize that with you. You have a shepherd that David is clearly pointing out that says he wants to be there. He's present. He's willing. He's able. He wants to protect you. He wants to guide you. He wants to provide you for you so you lack nothing. Why wouldn't you start your day aligning with him? You're going to be at your best when you're closest to the shepherd. Start your day in that alignment with him. Every single day, start your day. And again, some of you guys, like prayer team, right, like these guys, like they'll wake up in the morning and they spend like four hours on their knees in prayer. Awesome, right? That doesn't have to be you. It's great if you could do it. it doesn't Start your day. Dedicate like a minute. If that's your starting place, start with a minute. Just start there. Start with a scripture in a devotion or something. Just start with something because I'm telling you, any alignment is better than none. Do what you can, make that appointment, and start your day with alignment, okay? The third thing that you're going to see in your life when you're away from the shepherd is you're going to have a need to consume, right? A need to consume. And before everybody, like, gets on me, like, dude, you're chunky too. Like, hey, that's not necessary, you know? <laughs> Unnecessary. It's not what I'm talking about, okay? What we're talking about here is, like, that need for the next thing, okay? Because what you're going to find is when you don't have a shepherd, you're going to get so caught up in toys or something to distract you because what you really have is a hollowness inside, okay? So you're going to have this need to consume. And, and again, going back to sheep, right? So sheep, how dumb are they, Sean? All right, so sheep, what they'll do, if they catch a scent of food, they will literally, like, ignore everything around them. If it's like a berry or something, they'll ignore everything around them, and they will just make a straight line trying to get to it. And if you're not familiar with the terrain in Israel in those areas, there were thorn bushes all over the place. That's where you hear like terms a lot, like thorns and thistles, or they made the crown of thorns and stuff. Like these bushes had like gnarly, big old thorns. And so sheep, 
wouldn't think to go like, well, I'm really hungry. I want that. Let me just go around. They will go right into it. And they'll cut their face and they'll dig in. And then once they're dug in, instead of being like, this doesn't feel too great. Maybe I should go back. Instead, they'll just dive in further and dig in deeper. And I know it sounds silly, but we know we've been at that stage in life or we're in that stage in life where we just see something and we lock it in and we push and we push because we want that next raise. I want that next promotion. I want that next toy. I want to upgrade this or I need this part here. And so we stress and we push and we push and we're snappy with people around us and we're cutting off things that we know the Lord's telling us or we're taking shortcuts in our life to try to make something happen when we're just digging in and we're digging in and then what happens when you get to that berry you get to that food and you consume it what is it never satisfied you look back at all the pain the turmoil and hate and frustration you had just to get where you are and you realize it's not worth it and then what do you do you double down and look for more because surely it's got to be out there somewhere and you go further and you dig in further that's a life without a shepherd that's you just paying attention to what's in front of you right sheep will eat so much if they're given things that they enjoy like a, a food that they really gravitate to they will eat so much to their death they will overeat to death that's so similar to our lives and if anybody's ever been operating under addiction and and again if if you do have an addiction to many different things whether that's pornography or drugs or alcohol i want you to know we have celebrate recovery that takes place thursday night sunday night at our dream center location please lock into that if you need help connect with that we can help you out in the lobby but it's that idea of those of us who have been through addiction you know exactly what it's like where you fight so hard to consume it and then when you consume it what do you feel lack and then what do you do? You look for the next high. You look for the next opportunity to grab hold of it. So it sounds crazy that sheep do this, but we will literally binge ourselves to death on whatever it is that helps soothe that wound for that little bit of time until we're literally at the end of our rope, right? Again, as much as I'd love us to compare to war horses, I think you're seeing we're very much sheep, amen? So it's the practical way for us to move through this idea of, of consuming or that need to consume. I want us to take a look at Haggai, and it says you eat but are not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but can't keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in the pockets filled with holes. I know we felt that way before, where it's like, it seems like everything's going right, but why does everything feel so wrong? Okay? So the practical way to walk this out is that a lot of times we'll feel this way when we're, leaving, when we're living a life that's focused on greed and selfishness. And it's just my opportunity to be honest with you. If that's how you're feeling, it likely is that you're living for yourself. When you're living for yourself, you will feel exactly what it's pointing out there in Haggai. And so what do I recommend? And we're, again, the expectation is that you're starting your day in prayer now because there's no way you wouldn't listen to me after the last point, right? So we're starting our day in prayer. And if I could ask you, if this is a, a something that you struggle with, I struggle with selfishness because I'm a human and I have a heartbeat, right? So I struggle with it. Pray with your hands open. And when you open your hands, I want you to remind yourself and say, all I have is given, and all I have I should be willing to give. That's your posture. When you have that posture, there's no reason that you're going to grab hold of it, right, and, and hold it so tightly and feel like it's yours. When you have that posture, it's going to help you know that all I've, been, all I've had has been given, and I don't want to take anything that isn't mine. I only want what my shepherd gives. And whatever my shepherd gives, I need to be willing to give to the sheep. That's what our life is supposed to be like. That's what we're supposed to be dedicated to. But the moment you start grabbing hold of things and making it your own is the moment you're starting to live a life that's selfish and a life misaligned with the shepherd. Amen? So in this idea of, of, of a shepherd and a sheep, I, I want to spend a little bit of time now, too, to talk about this idea of, we, I, is everybody in agreement sheep are dumb? Awesome. So we, we know our place now, right? Awesome. We know where we stand in this, you know, relationship with the Good Shepherd. But maybe you guys don't realize how amazing and powerful the Shepherd is, right? Because, again, growing up, you know, and, and you guys realize, like, dude, Sean has a weird childhood. But growing up, right, like, my idea of a Shepherd was like, I don't know. 
like, you know, the white robes and, like, you know, like, dancing to and from and everything's chill and they got their little rods and, I don't know, it just seemed really chill. Like, they're just, like, you know, dainty, you know, nice people because that's kind of what they put on. I don't know. I grew up in a weird environment. That conversation took a different turn than I wanted. But either way, like, I had this idea, like, shepherds are just, like, these really dainty, like, sweet people. But then when you read David's perspective in Samuel, he spells out. Like, he's, he's in this opportunity where Goliath is challenging the whole nation of Israel. And the whole nation of Israel is just basically saying, like, never mind, right? Like, that dude can challenge us all he want. I'm not going to be the one to fight him. And David shows up. And again, just to give you an understanding of David, David was not like this big, buff, burly-looking, Viking, barbarian dude. Even though when you read his, like, stories, you think, like, this dude must have been gnarly, but... The reason why we know this is because in, in Samuel, Samuel's told to go to the family of David and anoint a king. But Samuel doesn't know who it is. So the dad aligns all of the kids up. And Samuel's going to walk by and pick which one God wants to appoint as king. So Samuel walks through and he's like, is it this dude? No, no. He goes through all the brothers. And all these brothers are like, you know, clearly it's that dude. And then Samuel's like, I don't know, God, you're kind of making me look dumb. That's all of them. So he asks the dad. He's like, that's all of them, right? And the dad... His own son, the dad's like, well, I mean, I do got this, <laughs> I do got this little whippy kid. It's out like shepherding sheep, but like, trust me, you don't want me to get that guy, right? Like, he's out there with his heart, you know, like, da -da 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 -da. it's David, right? Like, I always imagine, like, when I get to heaven, David's going to be like, what? What'd you call me? Anyway, so David's, David's there, right? And so David gets, gets finally pulled in, and God's like, that's him, and, and, so David now is in this opportunity where he's walking and he's delivering food. Again, he's not even a soldier. He's delivering food for the soldiers, for his brothers. And he walks up and he hears the, the Goliath dude challenging him. And David's response is this. He's like, you guys don't understand. As a shepherd, when a bear showed up to get my sheep, I killed it. Anybody seen a bear in real life? Dude. Don't play with bears. That's my survivalist tip of the day, right? <laughs> Don't play with bears. He says, when a lion shows up to take my sheep, I killed the lion. David, like, as a shepherd, had to handle some gnarly situations, right? He had to handle some, some enemies that were coming to his fold to try to take his sheep, and that shepherd handled business, right? Like, the shepherds, it's not some, like, you know, Heart playing, flute playing, you know, hippie kind of thing, you know, like it, it's gnarly. They, they fought battles. They took on like wolves and, and bears and lions. And so, like, I want us to understand, like, when God says, like, when it's under that understanding, like, I am your shepherd, it means like, I'm going to fight whatever it is that comes to take you from me. The most dangerous thing for a sheep is not what's coming for it, it's getting away from the shepherd. I'll say that again. The most dangerous thing for you in your life, because your sheep, is not what's coming for you. It's when you get away from your shepherd. That's when you're in danger, not what's coming for you. It says there in Psalm 23, David says, you make a table for me. You make me dinner in the presence of my enemies. That's a flex. Hey, let me get your enemies together and let's dine, bro. Come on now, like, that's God, like, flexing and saying, like, there is nothing you have to worry about because I am your shepherd, right? Like, that, that's what we have. And so Jesus doubles down on this. And in John 10, he's talking to the disciples, and he's giving them, like, clarity as to who he is. And so what he says, he says, I'm the good shepherd. See, the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. He puts the sheep above the shepherd. That makes no sense to me. I feel in my identity many times the feeling of a sheep in a flock that has the value of what? I'm another sheep. And Jesus does not allow any kind of misguidance or lack of clarity on this. Jesus says, hey, as the good shepherd, I lay down my life for you. He says a, a hired hand will, will run when he sees a wolf coming. When danger comes, he's going to take off. He's going to abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him. 
He is in their shepherd, and so the wolf attacks, scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. Jesus says, that's not me. See, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my fathers know me, and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Come on. <laughs> We're talking about the names of God, like this identity as to who God is. And, and if you've ever been in a misunderstanding as to who God is, Jesus says, if you see me, you see the Father. Right? So it's like Jesus is saying, like, that, that what we see in Jesus, we could clearly see in the Trinity. And so Jesus says, hey, the heart of the Father isn't to beat up, to cast down, to, to neglect, to push away the sheep. The, the view of the Father is he lays, his down, lays down his life for the sheep. Because as powerful as he is, he says, I know you. He's not distant from your turmoil. He's not distant from your situation. You just have yet to acknowledge that he's right there and turn to him. You serve a good shepherd. If you're new to this faith or if you're wrestling with it and maybe you've had an identity of who God is and maybe you've seen it in a different light, can I just tell you here and now, Jesus says, this is who I am, the good shepherd, and this is what I do. I lay down my life for you. That's the identity of the Father. That's the name for which we have to grab hold of. So what does it look like? When we're with the shepherd, when we have that alignment, when we have that clarity, the first thing that you're going to find is that your faith is going to be stronger than your perceptions. See, I, I jump into that, that psalm that I love so much where he says, I, I prepare a meal in, with your enemies. Like, again, like that idea of our perceptions. So we're going to look around and we're going to see, dude, I can recognize I'm in danger because I see all this stuff around me that's coming for me. I can recognize things are not looking good in my situation. And God says, you could see it all you want, but your faith had better be that we're about to have dinner. Right? Like you could see what it is that you see, but what I'm telling you is clear is that you and your shepherd are about to have a good meal. Right? Let me pour some grain for you because we're going to enjoy this time. Right? You can see wolves. You can see lions. You can see bears. I've handled that before. I'll do it again. But we're about to have dinner. Enjoy, right? Like that, that's the kind of God that you serve. And, and it says in that Psalm 23, 4, it says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, when you do it, the sheep must walk through the darkest valley to get to the most flourishing mountains. You have to. If you stay there and consume for so long, there's going to be season changes. There's going to be where that, that the rivers run dry. There's going to be where that the grass is now done. And you have to be willing to go from mountain to through the dark valleys to get back to the mountain of flourishing. It's a when, not an if. And if we are misaligned with the shepherd when we're in those dark valleys, instead we turn and run rather than just drawing closer to him. And that's what we need to do. So again, it's that idea of that my perceptions are not leading me, but rather my faith is leading me. The next thing that you're going to find when you're aligned with him is that his provision is going to be all that you need. You can fight. You can You can push. You could strain, you can stress for that next thing. But the heart of a sheep is all I want is where the shepherd leads me. I don't want to push away and pursue my own thing. I trust my shepherd that he's leading me where I need to go. I trust that even though I could push myself beyond stress, abandon my family, take that job out of town, do all these things to set myself up for failure, but it's going to make me an extra $20 an hour. You could trust in your own abilities, or you could trust that God's got something right around the corner for you that's going to be maybe less, but your life abundance is going to be more. Because all I want, all I want is what my shepherd provides for me and to stay close to him. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack for nothing. Right? That's that Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. And when Paul writes to the church of Philippi, it's one of my favorite scriptures of all time. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or an empty one, with plenty or litter, little, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Whether I'm starving or I'm flourishing does not change my proximity to the shepherd. 
whether I've been able to succeed at my job or whether I feel like a failure, it doesn't matter because it's with Christ I draw my strength, not from my job, not from my career, not from my raise, not from my promotion, not from my identity that others see me as, not from all those things are going to fail you in the end. It's guaranteed all those things will leave you in the end. But if I draw my identity and my strength through Christ, who is my good shepherd, he will never fail me, leave me, forsake me, turn from me, abandon me. He will fight my fight. He will take on the bear. He will take on the lion, and he will succeed. Amen? The third item, the final concept, and in my opinion, the most important concept, is Jesus must become my shepherd. My shepherd. Many of you have been living under this lie for so long that you've seen Jesus as a good shepherd. But he's not my good shepherd. I know that Jesus will show up for them because he's good. He's a good God. He's powerful. He's mighty. I know God will show up for them. But they don't know what I've done. See, I've, I've pulled myself far. I'm so locked into the thorns and the thistles. I'm, I'm so heavy. I'm so lost. I'm, I'm, I've done so much. I've consumed so much. There's no way the good shepherd looks at me and says, he's part of my flock. No, no, no. He's a good shepherd, but he's not my good shepherd. That is the biggest lie of the enemy that you can ever digest, and we do it all the time. Jesus is not shocked at the stupidity of a sheep. Can I be honest with you? God is never up there like, whoa, I never thought they'd do that. Okay? He is well aware of how far we run to bring satisfaction that we know is just not going to fulfill. But when we change the identity to be he's not a shepherd, he's my shepherd, you find life. You find that his burden is easy and his his yoke is light and and I, I can do this I can make it I can put my trust in him you could find that you're living a life of victory rather than constant defeat you could find that you no longer have to live under stra- stress and anxiety and fear and instead you could buy into that you have a shepherd that knows exactly where you are and knows exactly how to get you out does it mean it's always going to be easy no See, here's the thing about a sheep. When you're pulling it through the thorns, guess what? It's going to get cut a little bit again. When you're shearing a sheep that's grown too full, guess what? It's going to get snagged a little bit. It's going to pull a little bit. It's going to hurt a little bit. See, the thing is when you've dived in so deeply with your friends, it's going to hurt when you have to step away a little bit. When you dove in so deep to the addiction, you're going to have sometimes that you go through withdrawals and you think about it again. There's going to be things that that ache and hurt and, and you miss and you wish. But aligning with the good shepherd is going to be well worth it in the end. Again, it's this idea of the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. And and Jesus spelling out in John 10 again, he says, The sheep, they recognize his voice and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name as he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow because they know his voice. They're not going to follow a stranger. They run from him. Because they don't know his voice. So many of you guys have been running from the voice of God because you see him as a stranger. And it's time that you make him your shepherd. I grew up terrified of the scripture that said, you cast out demons in my name. You do these miraculous things in my name. But you don't know me, so please go away. And that terrified me. But the truth is, it's a very simple connection. It's shifting from the, I know him as a powerful God, to I know him as my powerful God. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.